I sure appreciate it. I got it yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Welcome to all of you on this very pleasant and beautiful, almost summer-like afternoon. My name is Bill Shank. I'm with the National Park Service. Uh, my role here today will be to try to assure that uh, the folks speak, speak in order and that I introduce them to you so that you know who they are. And at some point in time, we will, uh, we will wind this up and get back on our way to enjoying a wonderful day. Uh, first of all, I'd like to take the opportunity to introduce the people seated behind me. And the first person I would introduce is Senator Robert Caston, Jr. Um, starting on my far right is Mac Berg, who was the study team captain for the uh, study that was done here for the park. On my left and behind me is Paul Wade, the chairman of the Marquette County Board of Commissioners. Brindelson, who is a nearby property owner. He's labeled as the Eric. <laughs> Peter McKeever is the state director of the Nature Conservancy on my right. And Carl Zakella is the regional director for the Sierra Club's Midwest region. I would also like to take the opportunity to represent to uh, recognize some other very special guests here today. We have State Representative Ben Bransell. Ben, where? We have with us from the Department of Natural Resources of Wisconsin, Mark Martin and Darlene Carroll. Whatever they are. We have Fran and Don Sprain. Fran is with the Marquette County Historical Museum, and Don is the Vice Chairman of the County Board. Gary Sorensen, who is the county clerk. <laughs> Bessie Eggleston, who is a relative of the Ennises, for whom this lake is named. Bessie, are you here? There she is. Tom McDowell, who is the former, former county board chairman and uh, one of the first people I met in terms of this project, so Tom. And we have Millie Stanley, who has uh, also been a very strong supporter of this concept over the years. Yes. Millie. <laughs> and last and certainly not least, we have Pat Miller, who was the trail, the North Country Trail supervisor at the time we began this project uh, way back when, and a former superintendent of Apostle Island, now happily retired in northern Wisconsin, and uh, <laughs> came down to give us Also, a number of other folks here from the National Park Service, and I uh, would recognize them collectively as the Park Service Group out of Omaha. And I thank you one and all for your efforts, and uh, you can individually get to know the rest of these folks as the day goes on. Just a brief word about the National Landmarks Program, and I, I truly do mean brief because there are any number of people who have some things to tell you today. The, the Landmarks Program recognizes significant historic cultural or natural resources across the uh, across the country. It does not convey national park designation, but indeed sets apart those uh, landmarks as, as truly significant features, uh, not only within the states, but uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the United States. And it was that recognition that was bestowed upon this particular location in late 1990. Uh, the uh, determination of the significance of the area was done by a number of folks, and because of its significance, it culminated in a study that would talk about management options for the John Muir Park. The person who conducted that study, and the one who's going to tell you a little bit more about it, is with us today, and that's Mac Berg, the superintendent of Wilson's Creek National Battlefield in Missouri. So, Mac? 
The floor is yours. Thank you. Or the ground is yours. <laughs> <laughs> Kind of noisy around here. I don't know what this is off to the, <laughs> the right, but I'm having trouble hearing from the, uh, 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 the birds, the cranes. That's kind of appropriate. Maybe they like what's going on today. I, uh, I'm really pleased to have the opportunity to speak briefly for the team. Uh, it was a, uh, a little different sort of a planning team that we put together. And I think uh, all of us grew to very much appreciate the area. And I think it was truly a labor of love for those of us in the Park Service because of the obvious ties that John Muir has to the Park Service, to the conservation uh, uh, movement. I think uh, Dr. Robin Wink at Yale, in some of his correspondence, made the comment about the National Park Service as a collective monument to a conservation uh, ethic. And certainly uh, John Muir uh, is a, a significant transcendental individual in that right. The team was unique in that uh, there were three local boys that uh, helped us with the, uh, with the team. Dr. Arnold Allenon from the University of Wisconsin, uh, Mark Martin, uh, you've already uh, uh, heard him introduced, and Paul Mathai, both of the uh, Department of Natural Resources the state of Wisconsin. Uh, Don Stevens, uh, historian from the regional office in Omaha. Greg Bruff, an interpretive specialist from Pictured Rocks National Lakeshore on the shores of Lake Superior. And Tom Thiessen, an archaeologist from uh, the uh, Midwest Archaeological Center, is represented today by the director of that center, Cal Calabres. Yeah. I think all of us uh, really grew to appreciate the site. And th th this is my third trip up here in the last, uh, I guess, six months for a variety of reasons. And the thing that just comes back to me over and over again is that at some point, we have to look beyond just this site and look at the rich cultural landscape that surrounds the site. When you think about the Aldo Leopolds, when you think about the rich heritage, the rich ethnic heritage that's in this area, uh, as you drive along and you uh, look at uh, uh, ramp barns, uh, it, uh, it truly is uh, an area that's a, a, a cradle of uh, uh, environmental uh, ethic. As you have the opportunity to look at the study that we did, You'll notice there is not a team choice or a recommendation. There is a series of alternatives. I hope that you will all take the opportunity to read the study, to discuss it with your friends, neighbors, associates. And that I think from the study itself, you can conclude uh, how the team feels about the area. I personally uh, hope that the interest in the site doesn't wither and wane and that this site takes its place among other monuments to uh, a conservation ethic across the country. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today and for the opportunity to spend uh, really a couple of years along with my compatriots working on a uh, study for a very worthy, very worthy area. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matt. I think Johnny's talking to us from over here along <laughs> the side of the river today. Next we have uh, Paul Wade, who is the chairman of the Marquette County Board, and he will chat with us a little bit about the county's role in this development. Paul? Just very briefly, because the senator tells me he has a 45-minute speech prepared, and <laughs> he's doing bearable at 3 o'clock. <laughs> but on behalf of the County Board of Supervisors, it's indeed a pleasure to welcome so many distinguished guests here today. John Muir Memorial Park has had a special place in Marquette County residents for many years. It's nearly 50 years ago that I attended a one-room school about two miles from this site, and we did study about the life of John Muir in this area. And nearly 40 years ago, the 
homemaker clubs of this area recognized the importance of the site and started urging support, urging the county board to acquire it for a county park. In 1957, John Muir Park became a reality. Now, 34 years later, we're proud the National Park Service has seen fit to name the home site of John Muir a National Historic Landmark. The residents of Marquette County and surrounding area have enjoyed the park as a recreational area for many years, fishing, boating, picnicking, and nature study. The local 4-H clubs use it as a picnic area, study area, softball games. It certainly is an incentive for the schools of the area to study the life of John Muir, the national park system. It very definitely is a drawing card to bring tourists into the area. There are two handouts down on the table down here in boxes that we urge you to take with you as you leave. Uh, one is management options uh, that's been prepared by the Department of Interior and the National Park Service and also another informational sheet on the area prepared uh, by the DNR. So again, on behalf of the Marquette County Supervisors, uh, welcome to Marquette County and to John Muir Memorial Park. Thank you. Next on our list of folks to address you is Eric Brindelson, and I guess I'd have to say that every project has someone who, uh, who either up front or in the background keeps moving things along, keeps you headed in the right direction, and attempts to uh, focus the project uh, to its ultimate conclusion. And I think in the case of this particular project, Eric Brindelson was clearly one of those people. So Eric, I understand you have a few words to share with us today. on the 5th of April. As a boy in Dunbar, Scotland, John Muir read of a wonder-filled country with boundless forests full of mysterious good things, trees flowing with sweet sugar growing in gold-filled soils, where hawks, ospreys, eagles, and passenger pigeons darkened the sky like storm clouds, and millions of birds' nests were scattered about the entire wild, happy land. Still in his 10th year, John, with his father Daniel, sister Sarah, and brother David, sailed away from Glasgow, carefree as thistle seeds on the wings of the winds, toward the glorious paradise over the sea. Near the end of his life, Muir remembered his first impression of Fountain Lake Farm, this sudden splash into pure wildness, baptism in nature's warm heart, how utterly happy it made us, nature screaming into us, wooingly teaching her wonderful glowing lessons so unlike the dismal grammar ashes and cinders so long thrashed into us. Here, without knowing it, we were still at school, every wild lesson a love lesson, not whipped, but charmed into us. Oh, that glorious Wisconsin wilderness. I believe that childhood is the foundation of adulthood. If indeed this premise is true, then the Muir's pioneer homestead, named Fountain Lake Farm by Daniel Muir, was the cornerstone in the exceptional life of John Muir. The native beauty of the home landscape provided an already curious Scotch lad with amazement, awe, and wonder. Muir experienced, as we all do, an evolution in his perceptions of spatial magnitude, time, and living scale. We may recall how high a neighborhood hill or even dirt pile appeared to us as children, and how summer vacations felt as though they would go on forever, or how far away the 100 miles to Grandma's place seemed, and how large we thought our house was. Then, in time, we inherit the label adult. In adulthood, we return to find our memories in miniature. The childhood mountain has somehow eroded into a mere hill, and the home place has likewise shrunk to the point that we are astounded that a bustling family even survived in such a humble structure. Summers have become only a few short months, and 100 miles is now just 100 miles. For John Muir, that passage was realized here. As a boy, Muir was fond of climbing his neighborhood rampart known as Observatory Hill. While atop the promontory and perched in a red juniper, young John enjoyed watching a thunderhead roll across the valleys below. As a man in the Sierras, he continued this practice. 
In youth, 1,100-foot Observatory Hill was mountaining up and the juniper had the stature of a sequoia. The formative years spent on this old sand farm were among those most cherished and important to John Muir. Even while on a worldwide journey, Muir's memories often took him home. When we first saw Fountain Lake Meadow on a sultry evening, sprinkled with millions of lightning bugs throbbing with light, the effect was so strange and beautiful that it seemed far too marvelous to be real. Once I saw a splendid display of glowworms in the foothills of Calcutta, but glorious as it appeared in pure starry radiance, it was far less impressive than the extravagant, abounding, quivering, dancing fire on our Wisconsin meadow. He wrote, John Muir never lost what Rachel Carson called a sense of childlike wonder. It is a spe special privilege to be a part of the landscape so dear to John Muir. Still today, one can sense the power of the place and its historical sacredness. There are times yet when the spirit of John of the Mountains can be felt in the prairie sand underfoot. It was John Muir's dream to protect and restore his boyhood spring meadow, a dream later shared by another seminal Wisconsin naturalist, Aldo Leopold. In November 1895, in a speech given to the Sierra Club in San Francisco, Muir recalled the evolution of his preservation ethic. Saving bits of pure wilderness was a fond, favorite notion of mine long before I heard of national parks. When my father came from Scotland, he settled in a fine region of Wisconsin, beside a small glacier lake bordered with white pond lilies. And on the north side of the lake, just below our house, there was a sedge meadow full of charming flowers. And when I was about to wander away on my long rambles, I was sorry to leave the precious meadow unprotected. Therefore, I said to my brother-in-law, who by then owned it, sell me the 40 acres of lake meadow and keep it fenced. And never allow cattle or hogs to break into it, and I will gladly pay you whatever you say. I want to keep it untrampled for the sake of its ferns and flowers, and even if I should never see it again, the beauty of its lilies and orchids is so pressed into my mind, I shall always enjoy looking back at them in imagination, even across seas and continents, and perhaps after I am dead. Behind us, I should say to the side of us, is the lake that first challenged Muir's metal. In fact, he nearly drowned in it. But ultimately, its frogs taught him to swim, and swim he did to rare depths indeed. Trying to resurrect John Muir the mortal is like trying to recreate a passenger pigeon. Rather, today, as we pay homage, homage to this great place and its man, we are gathered to resuscitate his spirit and revive his philosophy. The most important lesson John Muir learned from Fountain Lake Farm is that everything is hitched to everything else. This is the Muir message into which we must breathe life so it can live and flourish throughout the land. I extend my heartfelt appreciation to all of you who continue to make John Muir's dreams come true. Thank you. Next on our agenda is someone who looked a little bit askance as that young lad went wandering through here, and I think he thought maybe he was going to steal his lines, but nonetheless, I think your 45 minutes is still sacred, so <laughs> the, cast, the uh, podium is yours. Thank you very much. my 35 minutes speech. I just can't say how happy I am to be here and I just want to say thank you to to all of you who have joined us in this effort I there's one person that uh, worked awfully hard on this and everyone who's associated with the, the effort is aware of Alex Eccles on my staff and uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't at this time thank him for the work that he has done he's a friend of many of yours and we tried to have Alex here for this day it wasn't possible but I I know that he's going to be back here soon, and he's very proud of what we were able to do. In a sense, today we're celebrating the, the end of a long journey, the culmination of our effort to honor the memory of Wisconsin's greatest environmentalist, John Muir, with this well-deserved landmark. But at the same time, we're also starting the next phase of this journey with the release of the management option document reviewing this site. In 1988, the 150th anniversary of John Muir's birth, I was contacted by Marquette County about the possibility of upgrading and recognizing this site and its contribution to Muir's development as an environmentalist. Since that time, I've worked toward that goal, and today we will confer national landmark status on John Muir's boyhood home. All of us know the inspiring story of John Muir's advocacy for conservation. He was a true environmental pioneer who had the year of President Theodore Roosevelt and helped create our national parks. And in a very real way, I believe, 
our tradition of modern environmentalism. But John Muir's environmentalism was not based on an abstract kind of an ideology. I believe it was based on a, on a very basic love. Throughout his life, he remained in touch with the woods and the streams of his boyhood. And it's these surroundings of his youth, the surroundings that lived on in his imagination throughout his career, that we are fortunate in celebrating today. When you look around here today, or, or even listen here today, you can understand how these Wisconsin surroundings change your passion for the environment. Within just a few miles are critical habitats for exciting plants and animals like sandhill cranes, the habitat that inspired, helped inspire one of Wisconsin's other great environmental leaders, Aldo Leopold. Clearly much of Muir's passion was nurtured here at Fountain Lake Farm and the surrounding country. As Muir declared, let our lawgivers then make haste before it's too late to set apart this surprisingly glorious region for the recreation and well-being of humility. That's what we're doing today, recognizing how a small piece of Wisconsin's natural heritage shaped the vision of one of our nation's greatest environmental leaders, John Muir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Senator Kessler. Peter McKeever is the state director of the Nature Conservancy and the director of the Wisconsin chapter of that group. And Peter, I understand you have a few brief words to say. Thank you. On behalf of the Nature Conservancy, I'm very pleased to be here today. We are proud of the role that we played in this project, though it was, in all due respect, a, a fairly minor role. In 1986, in partnership with the Sierra Club, the Nature Conservancy was able to make a land acquisition in conjunction with this park. The Sierra Club Foundation raised the funds, and the Nature Conservancy provided uh, legal services, uh, real estate services, and we still own a portion of this property. The mission of the Nature Conservancy is to preserve plants, animals, and natural communities that represent the diversity of life on Earth by protecting the lands and waters that they need to survive. With our 15,000 members here in Wisconsin, this is only a small portion of that work. There are four important features at this site that brought it to the attention of the Nature Conservancy. First of all, there's a very high quality wet music prairie here. That's a vegetation type which is threatened in Wisconsin and deserves to be protected. Secondly, the protection of the watershed of the lake, a deep, hard, good quality drainage lake. Third, diversification of the protection of the natural community types within this larger area. There is more here than simply the lake. There's a rich fen, a meadow, a bog, shrub car, the wet music prairie, the uplands that we see around us. This is a rich area in terms of vegetation and natural community diversity, and that's important that that be protected. And finally, the fourth feature here is this helped provide the complete protection of the remaining natural communities at John Muir's boyhood home. These four features of this site justified dedication of this site on March 19, 1987 to the state of Wisconsin as a state natural area. Under section 2329 of the Wisconsin statutes, this is the highest form of legal protection that's possible for land in Wisconsin. It's the intention of the Nature Conservancy to donate the 27.3 acres that we own at this site to Marquette County, and we hope to accomplish that very quickly. I think what this park represents in some respects is a very exciting partnership, an ex a partnership that involves the National Park Service, the state of Wisconsin, Marquette County, the Sierra Club, the Nature Conservancy, and private citizens. I think that partnerships like that, public, private, and nonprofit, are mandatory if we're going to successfully protect the rich natural and historic heritage of Wisconsin. It's that heritage that helped form John Muir's values and for which he advocated not only across the United States but around the globe during his lifetime and through his writings which continue. Thank you very much for the opportunity and congratulations to everybody who played a hand in bringing about this event today.
Kella is the regional director of the Sierra Club's Midwest region. I know that Carl has been active in, in some uh, work dealing with this site for some time. Very instrumental in the uh, development of the 150th anniversary celebration that went on here. And it's been in the background and in the foreground of discussions related to this uh, study and the various proposals that have gone on here. So, Carl? Thanks, Bill. It's truly a pleasure to be with you today to celebrate the designation of this wonderful place as a National Historic Landmark. I'd like to thank Senator Kasten and former Senator and great friend of the Sierra Club, Bill Proxmeyer, for their efforts in bringing this about. I'd also like to thank the Park Service, Eric, and many of the people that have already been mentioned, so we'll go through all their names one more time. I spoke with Senator Cole this morning, and while he couldn't be with us today, he asked me to extend his best wishes to all of you and offer these thoughts. He said to me, I'm confident that the next step from Muir Park will be one that benefits local people while making this historic site more nationally recognized. Wisconsin's conservation heritage is firmly rooted in these communities. Although Leopold was perhaps the first advocate for an established park on this site, said the senator, he would be thankful for the progress that has been made so far. I'd like to join him in thanking the members of the Marquette County Commission who also worked to make this day possible. We've been partners with the county since we raised the funds to acquire much of the land, as Peter alluded to, uh, a number of years ago. We look forward to working closely with the county to ensure a bright and lasting future for the park, for residents of the county, and for the nation. What a day. This is the kind of afternoon that Muir would have loved to go swimming in Fountain Lake in, and I can almost hear him splashing around out there today as he swam in his loved Fountain Lake. It's no surprise to me that I look around and he was so deeply inspired by this location. It inspires me. I've spent many pleasant hours walking around this, this park and the trail around the lake. Um, Eric has been very generous with, uh, with his time with me also, and two Sierra Club presidents have uh, walked these grounds with me in, in the last couple of years. Next year, the Sierra Club, the environmental organization we were founded, will be 100 years old. Last year, Yosemite National Park, Muir's first practical application of his dream for a system of national parks, celebrated its centennial. That dream, according to Muir's own writings, was conceived at this farm. What is it about Wisconsin that connects people so firmly to the land that engenders such fierce dedication to the natu natural environment? We are, after all, the state of Muir and Leopold, of Nelson, Proxmire, and Messenger, men of environmental greatness and inspirational vision. Wisconsin has not just produced great environmentalists, but men whose work provided the philosophical underpinnings of a global environmental movement involving tens if not hundreds of millions of people worldwide. Muir challenged the mere commodities production viewpoint that dominated our country's approach to its environment in his time. He enlisted presidents, as Senator Kasten referred to, and his efforts created a new national awareness that our wilderness heritage was being plundered by the timber barons and the mining trusts. This one man launched the American conservation movement he did it by recognizing, as Roderick Nash has written, that wilderness is part of the American mind, part of its national soul, recognizing that there are values to wild and beautiful places that no dollar sign could be affixed to. Muir saw God himself in nature and recognized that his protection was among the highest work man could apply himself to. People responded. The organization Muir built, the Sierra Club, has grown from 100 dedicated mountaineers to 650,000 caring American and Canadian citizens. It has truly become a global force for environmental protection and more, a sustainable way of living on this small blue planet of ours. Yes, this is a, st a historic landmark and we stand here today recognizing its importance to our nation's history in truly historic times. The challenges before us are daunting. We have little margin for error. Global climate change and the loss of world's tropical and temperate ancient forests are upon us. In our lifetimes, we may see the final liquidation of the ancient giant trees of the Pacific Northwest. Right here in Wisconsin, we're confronted with a choice of equal importance, whether, the, whether to allow some of our northern forests to return to their original conditions or condemn them to biological slavery as sterile monocultural tree farms. The Arctic National Wildlife Refuge is threatened by big oil and our nation's insatiable addiction to fossil fuels. It is no less than America's Serengeti, seen of the largest mammal migration in North America since the decline of the buffalo. This place here is important, not so much for what Muir conceived here and launched, as for what continues to be done in, his, in the reflection of his inspiration. The Sierra Club has grown so large because of our commitment to fight these fights. We're committed to a sane and sensible energy policy that does not ravage our greatest national treasures. 
We're committed to stopping ill-advised efforts to convert America's Serengeti to oil company cash in search of one last fix of oil. We're committed to protecting the biological heritage of Wisconsin and the senseless destruction of our nation's last ancient forests. I believe these are fights Muir would have been directly involved in. Muir's vision, conceived here at Fountain Lake, is carried forward by you and I, and by all people who don't want to see America reduced to a crowded, polluted, paved over place. Most importantly, Muir conceived his vision for us, for the people who followed him, that we may know the glad tidings of the mountains and the serenities of Northwoods Lakes. <clears throat> the idea as Muir conceived it was a legacy. He wasn't trying to protect Yosemite or anywhere else for that matter, for 10 years or even 100 years. His efforts were to protect them forever. He trusted that we would follow him, recognize the intrinsic importance of his message, and fight like hell for the short-sighted destruction of, of the birthright of future generations. He gambled that we would oppose people who knew the price of everything and the value of nothing. He also knew that landscapes provided inspiration. He was first inspired here. As his great work continues, it is fully appropriate that this landscape be designated a National Historic Landmark. The inspiration it provided a young Scottish immigrant more than a, more than a century ago has forever changed our lives. Thank you. Thank you, Carl. That concludes our list of speakers for today, and I, uh, I too came prepared with at least 45 minutes worth of remarks that uh, I'm sure will go totally unnoticed as we get on to what we really came here to do today. Uh, a couple things I'd like to point out, and I, I think it's been mentioned by several, but no good effort is done alone. And this indeed was a team effort, a team effort that included many or all of you and many people who may or may not be represented here today. But I would again like to specifically mention the Department of Natural Resources <coughs> for the designation as a stat state natural area, Marquette County for its continued protection of this area, the Nature Conservancy, the Sierra Club, Eric Brennelson as a property owner and driving force behind some of the things that we've been doing, and many other individuals and organizations who uh, are represented out here today. You all are indeed a part of the team, a team that has developed an already good product and a team that will truly move the product forward into even better success. I think it's truly appropriate that as we recognize a number of things, that this ceremony should take place today in the 75th anniversary of the establishment of the National Park Service. And uh, as we add this landmark to the list of things that we review and deal with, uh, it joins uh, a list of many other parks and landmarks throughout the country that have grown and developed over our 75-year history and will probably begin to set a basis for the sort of landmarks and parks that we will deal with and protect in the next 75 years of our existence. So with that brief conclusion, I would like to again ask Senator Kasten to come forward. We have a couple of things to do. And the first thing I would like to do is to present him with a pin recognizing our 75th anniversary that you may, may or may not wear. Or be our pleasure to uh, present a commendation to Marquette County and we'd like to ask Paul to step forward if you would please and accept it on behalf of the county. Senator, there is the I should explain that this, uh, this commendation which uh, I trust will be displayed promptly at the uh, county uh, Paul somewhere, uh, is only a symbol of the actual plaque that will be brought here and placed on site as a recognition of the, of the landmark. Uh, the, the bronze plaque will commemorate the site, and I suppose what we've really done is laid the framework for another ceremony and celebration to come back again <laughs> to the Mayor County Park and recognize what's going on here. But at any rate, congratulations to you, Paul, and thank you. Thank you. We're... Uh in Marquette County, always ready for a party or a celebration. <laughs> this will be displayed in the courthouse, and of course, when the bronze plaque comes, it will be appropriately placed here in the park. Thank you. Thank I you. also have a 75th anniversary pin for you. <laughs> Thank you. Recognition of Appreciate it. A good partnership. For, uh, <laughs> Thank you. I 
should mention all of the other participants who contributed to this uh, to this property and to the things that have gone on here. But we would especially like to recognize today Eric Brindelson for his contributions. And so, Senator, if you would again assist me, we will present Eric with a commendation regarding his efforts to preserve the Fond Lake Farm. get a bronze plaque, but he can also display this in some of the <laughs> And I also have a pin for you, right? uh, commemorating our 75th Thank anniversary. You, Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our formal program for the day. I thank you very much for your, your attendance. I would again remind you that copies of this study are available down here at the base of the hill near the parking lot. There are also copies of the state's natural area proposal there as well. And thank you very much for your cooperation. Go out and enjoy this day, okay? Thank you. The land designated as a National Historic Landmark is an 80-acre tract lying on the far side of Fountain Lake or Ennis Lake. The west side of the lake is in the distance.